Hey, what's going on, everybody? We have Ross Christofoli on today on Behind the Revenue. Ross, thank you so much for joining us. How's it going, man? Going pretty good. Happy to be uh, doing an early morning chat with my buddy. Awesome, brother. So, Ross, I, I got a lot to talk to you about today because I feel like, you know, for those, for the viewers watching this, me and you have this, like, sideline conversation where we, me and you communicate almost daily uh, mm -hmm. on Facebook uh, Messenger, and we always talk about marketing strategies and frameworks and tactics and all this stuff that really helps us level up our business, obviously, for the viewers. Um, you know, for those of you guys who don't know Ross, Ross owns an amazing company called Consolidata. Um, she does a lot of things, and we'll, we'll probably get a little bit more into that throughout the session here. But we we both run software companies, and we both go after marketing agencies. So, like, the conversations that we have are always so aligned, and it's always sometimes when we have the conversations, whether it's just straight up like, hey, let's jump on a quick Zoom call or Hey, let's let's talk about this one thing in Facebook Messenger. And I was telling Ross before we hit the record button on here, I was like, dude, I wish that our recordings or I wish I wish that our conversations would be broadcasted because if people could hear what we're saying, it would immensely help them in their business. And that's actually what inspired me to even get the podcast uh, going back on. So I'm super excited today. We'll ask a, a bunch of questions and we'll have some fun with it. Uh, but Ross, uh, tell us just really quickly for the viewers, you know, what is it that you do in Consolidata? Yeah, so, well, what I do or what Consolidata does? Uh, both. Both, yeah. So Consolidata is a data management company. So we um, it, we think of us as if Zapier had visualization, that's kind of where we're heading towards. So you can create these API connections in a way that's, in my opinion, a little bit more meaningful. So extracting data from uh, your CRMs and from Facebook ads and Google ads and your different ad platforms, putting it into a, um, into an, a nice report. We are actually moving into over this next quarter will actually be a completely white label capable tool that basically as an agency, somebody could sign up for it. Uh, or a marketing agency could sign up for it, brand it their own, and then their customers can come in, connect their accounts, and it just creates all these beautiful reports and metrics for them. We also provide some of our own data, like the Google My Business keyword tracking, where you see like those little grid maps yep. and um, hot jar style screen recordings and heat maps that's been doing well for us. And then most recently, we added in uh, a connection with OpenAI Assistant. And we're pairing that to platforms, to their chat platform. So like right now we're working on another one for Shopify. So that way when someone comes into Shopify, you know, they have that little chat widget in the bottom corner. They'll be able to have their assistant doing the responses in there. We've already got it going in a CRM. So we're, um, that's currently what we're doing is we're expanding that out where we built this cool feature and function and now we're expanding it out. As far as my role in the company, I really am... I kind of wear dual hats. So I am on product. You would say I am product management because I, the product starts with me. Like, you know, same I, thing here at Dashlix. Yeah. It's weird because I know you're not supposed to be the marketer, CMO and product guy. I am. You know, I, I found, I found that in most software startups, that's really what it is. It's, it's the person's idea ends up becoming the thing that that person builds and shares with the world, right? And eventually, I mean, at least for me, like you get almost addicted and attached to the product, right? Yeah. So you keep coming out with all these iterations and features and all this stuff and you keep wanting to put it out to the world. And that's, I think, why me and you end up staying in product. I think it's, it's something that I also I enjoy a lot of. Yeah, it is. It's fun. And you almost feel like too, like let's just say right now, you probably know in your mind, you know, for the next six months, next year i typically keep my roadmaps to about six months i don't go much further than that but let's say you're like okay for the next six months um this is what we're gonna do if you were to hand that over and say okay now you're the product manager to someone else they don't have the same vision as you they're, they're naturally a different person and they could start taking it down a completely different path so I do feel like maybe I hold that a little close to the chest and it could also show my immaturity in as a company because we're still immature. 
So, you know, you think about that and you say, well, maybe somebody like a HubSpot where they're doing, you know, okay, yeah, they're different because they've got, they're, they're a massive company. We're a small company. <laughs> you know what so I let mean? Me, let me ask you a quick question. If, you know, going, rewinding back to when you started Consolidata, what do you think was the number one push that you had that allowed you to become an established software company because there's a lot of software companies or even just companies in general they'll go out they'll build they'll get a handful of customers and then they just stay like that forever right and they just kind of like rinse and repeat but you're at the point now where you do have a pretty good user base uh and you guys are growing if i'm not mistaken month over month right oh for sure yeah actually yeah, so this week was our largest week that we've had ever you want to share some numbers something crazy well, I mean, it's not like for most companies, it's nothing to, you know, it's like whatever. But I was looking at it this morning because all night we've had people signing up. And as of right now, just since Monday and today's Thursday, we've had 60 something like 63 users sign up just since Monday. And for us, that's huge. Like, now What are those users paying? Is it, is it the 97 a month? That in the past, it was almost all $97 a month. But for some reason, this week, we've had this massive inflow of people paying $197 a month and just right away upgrading to the the higher tiered plan. So what do you think? What, what's what's causing that? Because you're seeing growth, right? What, what's yeah, causing that? It's the AI chat through we threw that thing in there. And all of a sudden, it's like it breathed new life into it. So when we first started Consolidata, I literally just took, we had built some backend tools to be able to pull data from ad platforms and put it on Google Sheets because I was like, I am not paying for super metrics. Like I'm a cheapskate. I really am. I shouldn't say that. I'm a frugal guy. I will pay for quality people. I will pay for quality things. But if I look at something and I'm like, because, you know, I used to own lead carrot. So it's like, I know what software is. And when I'm looking at this and I'm like, I'm not going to pay $300 a month for you to take data from my Facebook account and put that into a Google sheet. That's ridiculous. I understand that for big companies, like whatever, that's a big thing. And I, their origin story is very interesting. Uh, they started out of a contest, but not to get off of off track here. So we, I made a Canva mockup because I don't, I can't even figure out how to use Figma. Like that's how bad I am. And I, uh, I went on Canva and I made this mockup and I, made it look like buttons and things like that. And it actually looked pretty cool for of a graphic for being Canva. And I threw it in my Facebook group and I said, we're going to build this tool. It's uh, and I said exactly what it does at the time. It just extracted data and put it on a Google sheet. Um, we're accepting, I think I said like 20 people for a, a lifetime deal. We just want to see who would like to be a part of this. It's a thousand bucks if you get in now and we filled it up same day and actually we ended up opening up to more lifetime users and i think in total we've sold maybe 50 lifetime plans and most people don't even know we still have a high tier five thousand dollar lifetime plan that we maybe sell one or two of every month just because people will ask we tell them what it is and some people bite the bullet on it and it does help with product development when you're a bootstrapped company because you know it's like you know wow that was a uh, pretty much two developers you know, for the month <laughs> or a developer and a half. Let, but anyways, I want to dive deeper into that for one second because you made sure. a really good point. Um, and obviously just for context, I can definitely relate to that. I see you on social uh, creating tons of different offers. Like it's almost like every couple of weeks you got something new that you're throwing out into the market. And I know we briefly spoke about that this week, but I want to elaborate on one, why you do it and two, how that's actually helping your business. And, and, and three, how you're actually doing it. Like, how do you come up and iterate with these really quick ideas, throw them out into the market and just get some quick validation? Yeah, so what I've been doing lately, and this has been working really well, is I have a course that I'm going to end up launching here around spring. And because of that, you know, when the hardest part about building a course is like getting all your thoughts and training styles and like illustrations and ways that you want to like perfect your teaching of it together. That's difficult. And so what I like to do is I've always found that if I, and I think you're the same because I've watched you when you just start talking and sharing, like things just start coming out from like experience 
and you're like, ooh, I'm going to use that. And you write that down. You're like, that's going to become a part of my polished product eventually. So what I've been doing is I've been, I've broken up into four basically modules, uh, this course that I'm going to be launching. And I've been doing one hour class workshops for the last three weeks. And what I'm going to end up doing is taking those one hour sessions and turning them, not just like breaking them up and turning it, but re-recording them in like a polished format. I'm listening back to them as the week has gone on. I'm like, okay, I didn't like this. I like this. And so I'm listening to how I taught it. And then I'm listening to the questions people ask because the Q&A is so valuable, breaking that in. And now it helps me build a really good product because I don't want to throw together a product and just put it into the marketplace. I want it to be good. I feel like that, you know, and people love the live trainings that way because I can sit there and answer every one of their questions. It's, um, it's almost like the same reason people like live music. You know, it's like, it's, there's, even if it's not perfect, the live music, can, it's like, give me a, a favor really quick, just for context. What was like the last, one of these offers that you created where you did like a live training or something like that. Yeah. How many people showed up? What'd you sell it for? Like just add some, add some quick context. I'm I'm curious as to how the whole thing came about. Yeah. I think we did it last Thursday. Can't remember. It could have been Monday. My brain is toast, man. I also, as you can see, own a brick and mortar store. So my brains, um, but it was $197. We sold over 40 of them both times that we've done it two times now over the last two weeks or three times, maybe two or three times. Each time we sell just over 40 of them. A lot of people were repeat buyers. I'm not a big famous like influencer. So I don't have like, you know, you know, tens of thousands of people. I might have like on my Facebook profile, maybe like 2000 really engaged people. And then from there you have, um, you know, meaning they po comment on your post here and there. And then maybe my entire reach with email list and all that of a warm audience might be around 15,000. So it's not like, you know, some of these guys have, have these hundreds of thousands of people on their list. So anyway, we sold, the, that's what we did. As far as showing up on the lives, it was between about 15 to 25, but that's because I told people that they could get access to the replay. And yep. I've been putting it all inside school and allowing people to, you know, ask questions in the community. It's funny in one of my YouTube videos, and I don't, once again, my YouTube channel for Consolidate, it's small. It's like maybe 340 subscribers. Like it's, it's small. And 197 that you do, what, are you just posting on Facebook and gathering? Is that what it is? Is Facebook like your main source of sign-up? It's sign actually it's so funny. So I don't um, believe, I don't build funnels like, before I know that the product's going to work unless I'm okay. I take this back. I do have a, when I'm doing webinars, I'll build a funnel before I know the product's going to work. But like when I'm just testing out to see like, Hey, is there interest in this? I'll create a payment link on Stripe and then I'll just go make a post on it and I'll put comment this if you want it. And then when people comment, I just copy and paste a message that it's like, Hey, thanks for your interest. Here's the um, link to secure the spot. And I send it, man, it's crazy how that works. If people, the thing is, is though, and people miss this all the time. And I actually talked about this at CarrotCon, which you were at as well, that trust is really at the end of the day, the biggest selling point. Like if you have a good trust, if they trust you and you have a good offer, like that's all you really need. And I'm actually reading a book right now called trust. And it's, it's a really interesting book about just the psychology of trust. And when people, come through a funnel, but they don't know you. Oh man, you got to do all these weird things to build trust. Look, I was on, you know, good morning, Tennessee, you know, whatever. They do all these marketers go buy all these PR spots and they have to do all these funky things to try to make someone trust them. And if that's what I love about having a warm audience and a, a community is that when people trust you, you could throw offers out to them without having to build funnels and all that crazy crap. And then you sell it and then you can go take their testimonials, put that into a funnel, and now you can build trust organically. Talking about funnels, let's throw out a cool, uh, a fun, trendy topic. What do you think is happening with ClickFunnels? You I know, know I'm banned a lot from of, the uh... group. 
I've been banned from the group for like a year and a half or two years. So I don't know. Um, what'd you get do to get, what'd you do to get banned from the click funnels group? I think it's like, what did I not do to get banned from the click funnels group? I'm not sure. You know what? I got really frustrated when like, the thing is, is people who are just there for the education and maybe play around with the funnels do fine. But like when you start running a lot of, you know, dollars, I well, like my, with my last agency offer, I don't really teach agencies anymore. I've broadened out, you know, it's more software, some agencies coming in who are interested in adding software. But when I uh, had my last agency program, I was spending, you know, $1,000 a day at a time on ads because I was running it to a live webinar and then you'd stop the ads and so forth. And the and, funnel went down? Yeah, like when funnels, the page load speed was terrible. You know, I just had so many issues that I was always vocalizing that. And, you know, that's one thing that I like in a software company is when they'll take the feedback and they don't delete it. They listen to it and they go fix it. It shows that they're a product first. They are definitely a marketing first company. And I think what happened was competitors have come out around them and advanced past them. And they were forced to launch 2.0 knowing it wasn't ready yet. And it's crazy how many users they've lost. To, to well, I remember I remember going to Funnel Hacking Live, I want to say the two years ago. Uh, and they were supposed to be launching 2.0. I think they did like an announcement inside of Funnel Hacking Live that everybody was going to get access to it in like a couple of months or something like that. Uh, and then like a whole year went by and then I went to the next funnel hacking live, which was literally one year later and they were like, we're going to launch it today. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I still, I don't even know if it, they launched it or even if they did launch it, it came out with a massive amount of bugs, which yeah. is fine. I, I understand software companies. Like I, I have a software company and we have bugs and, and that's totally normal. We get it. But I agree with you, the fact that they were too early into the game. And I think what happened was, especially with me, and maybe you can relate too, but in Dashlix, we had this we had this moment in Dashlix where we had Dashlix 1.0. Um, and that was basically like highly focused on white label fulfillment. And then there was mainly like two tools in there. We had Insta Sites and Insta Reports. And that 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 was basically Dashlix 1.0. That's what it was. It was like, hey, you needed fulfillment. You'd come to us, you'd play some orders, we'd fulfill all your stuff, and then you could either use Insta Sites or Insta Reports. And in fact, for Insta Sites and Insta Reports, we were actually charging separately, right? So you would like, you could just go buy Insta Sites, you could just go buy Insta Reports, I right? remember that. Yeah. And then, uh, and it was going good. Like, you know, on day one when we launched Dashlix, and I'll never forget this, um, day one we launched Dashlix in uh, Rob Quinn's uh, Facebook group. Um, and, um, he had, I don't know, like maybe three, 4,000 members in his Facebook group at the time. And I literally 24 hours, we went live. We did like a live webinar. There was a couple hundred people live, um, on the webinar, which was great. We did live. And then within like 24 hours, we had like a thousand people sign up. Right. Mm -hmm. And what's funny about that is when I say a thousand people sign up, we didn't even have a sign up page. We literally had like a form that we built that would zap their information onto a Google sheet and one of my partners and co-founders had to literally go and create them an account manually, like in the back end of the database. It was and then we would plan. like email them their uh, temporary username and password. Right. So we didn't even have like a sign up page. Right. And uh, I thought that that was a fun story, but anyways, Funny. not to I get too off topic. So copy pasting all that. Yeah, dude, it, it was forever, but it was, you know, that's what you do at the beginning. Right. And, um, so that was 1.0, and then we wanted to basically redo the platform. So where I'm saying I can relate to ClickFunnels, and we kind of almost did it right around the same time that they were doing it too, which was funny because I remember being at the ClickFunnels conference, and they did like this whole like 30 minute thing where they're showing like all the new products for 2.0, and we're you know getting like the 2.0 launch you know little seminar that they were doing. In my mind, I'm sitting, I'm sitting, I'm like, dude, we're doing the exact same thing, and. Um, and the, the, the problem that we had, and this is where I can relate and give them some type of sympathy, is when we were building Dashlix 2.0, which is now like a full-blown CRM funnel builder. Like, I mean, it's got like the core, if, if Insta Sites and Insta Reports were like two of the main features, now we have like 15 features, right? So we've, we've definitely 10x the amount of features that we have in the dashboard, right? We thought it was going to take six months. It ended up taking two years, <laughs> right? 
and theirs also ended up taking two years. So that's why I can kind of relate. The difference is, is we didn't advertise that we were building 2.0 for two years. We kind of did it like behind the scenes. And then as we, we got a little closer to launching, like maybe within like two or three months, you know, we started, you know, running ads and doing all the advertising for it. And I think that's where ClickFunnels made the mistake. I think that they made the mistake by saying that they're launching 2.0 for like two years and not launching 2.0. And then when launching, nothing was working. Uh, when you go into the dash, I remember going into their dashboard because I was using ClickFunnels 1.0 at the time. I still have my ClickFunnels 1.0 account because we have a bunch of funnels on there that we've built and I'm just too lazy to move them over into dash clicks. That's the reality of what, what it is. It said somebody from my team uh, starting to take and, and build out all the funnels we have in ClickFunnels and dash clicks. We're almost done. But I remember logging into ClickFunnels 2.0 thinking that it was going to be great. And what it ended up being was a funnel builder with uh, menu links that all said coming soon, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if you, and I'm in the group, there's like 300,000 people in their Facebook group. And you just see people like users that have been in there, affiliates that have been in there, like selling their products for years, big affiliates, like just everybody's like almost bashing them basically yeah. in a way. And it's hard to see something like that as a software founder because you kind of feel bad in a way. You sympathize yeah. with them. So I do, but I'll share some lessons that I love to learn by watching them because this is, I think, super valuable because I made this mistake in Lead Carrot and I have not made this mistake in Consolidate. So, and, and I've noticed the difference. <clears throat> so I, I'm forever grateful, for instance, to Russell Brunson because he his yeah, content same. brought me into the marketing world. Yep. Uh, listening to his early, you know, marketing my car podcast and all the things. And I remember when I first signed up for ClickFunnels, they did like this 30 day email sequence where they sent you like a video every day. And like when you got the email, there was like a little flames coming up with the video. And I get so excited seeing that. And like every night I was like, hey, dear, I'll wash the dishes tonight. I put my phone up and we didn't even have a dishwasher. So I was washing all of our dishes at the time and watching his videos like i just remember that it was a great experience but he, they if you think about software the thing that makes it scalable is when you find product market fit then you're like okay now i know what product market you know i know what market i can sell this product to and then you find a repeatable way that you can keep selling it to that they have always gone after offer market fit and I did that with Lead Carrot. And I used to even teach people to do that too, because it helps decommoditize your software. And the, to what, just what is that? Offer, yeah. Off, yeah. Offer market some context, right? is like, I'm going to sell them, I'm going to sell them a course for a thousand bucks and give them click funnels for six months and hope that by the end of six months, they've stuck around long enough to be able to continue. So it's like fooling your customers into buying your software. And it, fooling might be a little negative a word, but it's like, you know, you know what an irresistible offer is. It's an offer that's too good to say no to. And so it's like, but they're doing that not based off features. They're doing that with education. And then ClickFunnels is just a part of it. Now, I'm all for selling education. As you heard earlier, I sell education. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But if that is at the heart of how you build your company, how many people like you and I today are now saying, I'm forever grateful to Russell. I love what he's taught me, but the software I had to leave. And if you listen, that's, an ex that's the reason why. It's because we loved the education side. And I actually feel bad for Russell because I feel like he's pulled his weight on the marketing and the sales end of it. His mm -hmm. devs, Todd, his development team has let him down. And I wow. know the feeling a nice, of selling different a Different way to look at it. And you know what? I guarantee you when he started talking about 2.0, it's because as the marketer, as the salesperson, his job is to keep and sell users. Well, I should say keep. That's really customer success. But it's to try to keep sales up. Yep. And if they're feeling from inside sales are starting to wane because of other companies coming out, he's got to start selling on, hey, here's our roadmap. Here's what's coming. I did that the last year. Thankfully, we delivered on... 95% of what we promised and we still have a piece that's still coming out that we said would come out next year. That's not out yet. That's just a part of the game of software. It will be out. But the point is, is that's kind of in the begin, you know, in your stages, what you're doing. I don't feel bad if you, I don't think you can compare yourself to them because they've got 
a lot more revenue than either one of us can imagine. So they have no excuse for I think not they're having... doing over probably a hundred million dollars a year. I, I would assume. So like you look at like us where I know you've got probably more developers even than we do, but when you're dealing with a dozen developers, you're not going to compare that to a company that's got, you know, a hundred developers. It's just, do you, you know. think that they have a hundred developers for some reason? I don't know why I could be wrong. I feel like ClickFunnels has a small development team. And uh, I remember I was at the, the Funnel Hacking Live um, conference and I met somebody. It was like their customer support manager, somebody that was like managing their live chat team or something like that. And they were basically saying like the big majority of their staff, like almost all of it is customer support. They had like, I think like 200 and something people in customer support. And well, I, I just. Hope- that's not true because that answers the question. Because you look at like their competitor that's taking their lunch right now; they've got over sixty developers. Yeah. What do you? What do you? I want to go a little bit deeper into the whole funnels thing because it's a it's a fun topic to talk about. One one question which is trending right now is what do you think? What do you think is happening with the whole uh, Russell Brunson punching a kid in the back of the head thing? <laughs> um. You know what? I haven't seen much in my news feed lately about it. Have you? Nope. I think it's one of those things that got like 48 hours of intense virality. So it's fading away. You know, I have um, refrained from really taking a a stance on it because I'll tell you why. When you look at that video from the top angle, it looks like he's punching a kid in the head. Even the first blow. When you look at the video Russell put up, the thing I don't like is it cuts short. Like you don't get to see because you can see in the video he goes like this, and in his video you just see this. So it's like, but you did see it hit his shoulder, and it looked like a similar hit both times. It didn't look like he moved it to his head, but I wasn't there. I didn't see it. So like, regardless, I'll tell you my real take on it is is I think that uh, I think if you're gonna put your kid in wrestling, and you're gonna stand on the mat. That's you're just it's a recipe for disaster. Like your kid's going to at some point look like he's in pain or I don't know. I I would never put my kids in wrestling personally. Um, I'm not a violent person and I'm not against having my kids knowing how to defend themselves, but they're not going to go learn how to fight. Like that's just not who I who how I am. No judgment to anybody who does their, yeah. their stuff. Yeah, everybody's different. So I, you know, but you know, the other side of me is like, if you're a parent on the mat, you see your kid getting choked and it, it, your amygdala kicks in. It's not, you know, I teach this in sales. You have your amygdala, your limbic system and your neocortex and your amygdala does not think it just reacts. It's a flight, you know, fight or flight mechanism and your kids are a part of you. And when you see that, I don't even think he had time to like, really think and that's why i think it's such a bad idea for a dad to be right there while his son's on the mat wrestling i i think that it's kind of sad because in the same way that like i didn't give a crap about what tiger woods does in his personal life i just like the way he hit a golf ball i don't really care anything about what russell brunson does in his personal life i mean he could play dungeons and dragons in the basement all day for all i care i just You know, I don't even really follow him anymore, but at the time, the stuff that he did, I loved was the marketing content. That's what I followed him for. I didn't follow him because he was a wrestling coach or because he was a dad. You know what I mean? Where, where do you, where do you think, you know, staying on topic of funnels for a second, where do you think the funnel game is going to? There's a lot of funnel builders out on the market, including Dash Lakes, Click Funnels, and a bunch of others. I think, yeah. I think that uh, funnels are becoming just a normal part of things. You know, people didn't realize that the conversion rate was better uh, on a funnel than a website for ads. It doesn't, that's not the case for Google and stuff like that. I have not found that to be the case. Like someone clicks on a Google link. I've not found funnels to convert better than my WordPress sites. Um, So, I think that um, it's it, it was being sold really heavy as like the end all be all like you don't need anything else in your business and that wasn't true. It was told that you can just funnel hack stuff and you'll have a business. That wasn't true either. 
but I do think funnels have a place and I think that they're a cool tool to have, but I don't think that it's, um, it's like this as hot of a, a thing anymore. Like AI bots are huge right now. Um, there's a lot of other things that are popping right now and it's, it's taking, and it's good because it means that the market is maturing. But I feel like with trends, and I know you said AI, and it's funny because I was having a conversation with one of my co-founders yesterday, and we were we were talking about AI and how it's trending right now heavily. But I feel like in like six to twelve months, all these things that you see of like you know AI video creation, AI phone calls, AI booking bots, like all of these different things that are like highly trending and highly viral right now. Like anything you post, like I posted something on my Facebook page about me creating a video avatar of myself. And I posted the video and literally we had hundreds of likes, comments, like the, the, just the, 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 the engagement was so crazy because it's so new, right? But I feel like in the next six to 12 months, it's just going to be like a normal thing. And there's going to be another thing that kind of comes back into the loop, right? What do you, what do you think is so. going to happen with that? Yeah, I hope so. I think that that would be good for things. Um, problem with trends and even like I see this right now with consolidated because of the AI chat is it doesn't give you a, it's kind of an inflated metric. Like, you know, I know it's a wave. I even posted on this two weeks ago. I'm like, Hey, this chat thing that we're doing probably it's always going to be here. We're going to keep developing it and making it cool. But the reason we're coming out and not charging $400 is because it's going to be a wave. And, yeah. and we know we add value in other areas of people's lives and we have, you know, a nice roadmap, but you look at some of these AI companies, I'll give you an example. Um, these AI bot companies, there's one called Closebot and Zappy Chat. They're direct competitors of ours um, in the AI space, but not by product. We, we do it completely different, but they charge $400 a month for what we're charging $99 a month for. Now think about this real quick. Jasper came out with as an AI software, perfect timing. Like they got perfect on that time. wave, like it was, it couldn't have been better. And, uh, but when they did that, it was before OpenAI's API was fully like even available to other people. They had like a early access to it because I remember following Dave Rogan Moser's post and he would be like, look, I just told it to have a conversation between Russell Brunson and Gary Vee. And look, I remember, and I remember yeah. seeing that stuff and being like, holy smokes. And so it was perfect timing, but they started raising their price to where I think at one point I was like 300 bucks a month for like the boss mode of Jasper. enterprise. We, we had an enterprise account with them and it was expensive, but now go on their website. It's $39 a month. What do you think is going to happen with them? I don't know. I heard they laid off them. a bunch of people, but my point is, is think about what that means for a company. How long can you hang on to that? You build a big company based off your current revenue. You hire people based off revenue. They had to let a lot of people go. You know, you you build your infrastructure based on here's our pricing, and now all of a sudden you have you are forced to drop your price to ten percent of what you were selling it for. Your your company just shrunk like that overnight. So what I believe is going to happen, like with these chat softwares, is OpenAI assistance is excellent. It is better than anything else on the market. And so when you look at these other chat bots, they have to do so much to make it work close to open AI assistant, not even as good because they're not using the assistant environment. They're using the same API that someone uses to write blogs. So they've had to modify it to do that. So you, you see, okay, now guys like myself have come out saying, Hey, I'm not going to recreate what OpenAI has done amazing. I'm just going to give you an easy way to connect this to all of your platforms. I don't need to recreate the chat platform because these guys already have in their built into their platform. I don't need to recreate the AI because it's already here. I'm just going to be a connector of dots. And I think yep. that's where the money is right now in AI is in because it's too expensive to try to go like AI is moving too fast. Like if you come up with an idea right now for AI and you build it, it'll be built in two to three months because someone's working on it right now. And like everybody last, will copy you. Yeah. Last night <clears> I was <throat> trying to find, and if you know of one outside of Pictori, I would love it. Cause I don't really like Pictori. I want to be able to upload a script as well as an audio recording of myself 
and it builds out a webinar for me. Images, graphics, slides, like everything. Yeah, I haven't had I've, the thing that I'm seeing with a, with AI right now, especially with the video stuff. And I just posted this on my Facebook too. Um, it's not there yet. The video stuff, like it, it's it's still even the the there's like Air AI, there's Hagen, um, there's Eleven Labs, there's like all of these different companies. Um, and primarily speaking on Hagen and Air AI because I've played around with those a lot yeah. in the last couple of weeks because I wanted to implement those into the company and they're not there yet. I'm not going to do it. Have um, you done the boss one? I haven't. Can you, can I show you a demo of it on here? I've, I've crazy. heard of it. I've okay. heard of it and it's pretty because crazy. I can call it on here. There's only two things I didn't like on it, but continue. Yeah. What, what I was going to say was it's, I still don't think it's there. I think it will be there in the next, you know, yeah. six to 12 months because these companies are going to continue to fine tune and get better at it. And, uh, but for me, like if I'm going to use AI to create videos and ads and, or webinars or like crazy stuff like that, if somebody knows that it's AI on the other end watching, it almost is like impersonal and it makes like, I feel like there's going to be like a disconnect because they feel like you're like cheating the system in a way or being lazy and, um, I don't know. That's just my thought. I don't think it's there yet. I will use it. I'm dying to use it. I just need to wait until I can get it to work good. Yeah. When the mass market is used to talking to AI, it'll change. It'll make things easier. Um, I have been thinking about how you're going to see people try to make this shift to all AI, realize it's not quite there yet, and then try to come in somewhere in the middle. Yep. And so I think that those – like I had this idea back when we had lead carrot. And I still think that if someone ever builds this, it'll be incredible. But you know, I had that large call center. Yep. And one of the biggest issues with overseas callers is they can't empathize with people. So I had this idea of what if you used AI and you put a face on the voice dialer. So that way, when my caller is talking, they see a face that has the expressions of the voice and it. Like they can read the body language because tonality is not a universal thing. Like I can go to the Chinese restaurant and think they're all screaming at each other, but that's just how they talk to each other while they're cooking. And so, but facial expressions are universal. You can see when someone's smiling, when someone's angry, like you can tell. So well, that's the thing I think about like, Hey Jen is an example that it doesn't have that yet. Like I'm saying, I'm saying something where I'm doing gestures and moving my hands but the gestures that I'm doing with my hands, they're not matching what I'm actually saying. And How that's did you where record that? What was the setup? I just literally went into the studio. They basically tell you to shoot a three to five minute video. Um, every time after every sentence, close your mouth. Um, so it you know gets good uh, lip sync movement. And um, don't bring your hands. If you're doing gestures, just do very basic gestures. Don't bring your hands above your chest. Don't wear certain clothing. Don't wear hats, stuff like that, because they obviously want to get like a clear video of you. And then you submit it, and it runs. And then after you run it, you basically fine tune it. You pay like eighty bucks a month, and it fine tunes the avatar. Once again, I did this twice. It got good, and I posted it on my pages. Yeah, with a bourbon. It wasn't in me, there. I couldn't tell. It, 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 but it, it's I don't know. I, it's for me, it wasn't there yet. I'm gonna wait a little bit until I actually start really producing it. I might use it to test like messaging for Facebook ads. I yeah. might just create a bunch of ads just to test like messaging and then like whatever, you know, whichever ones are the winners or high performers, I'll create like real videos out of it. Yeah. So that might be a good way to use it. Um, but yeah, it's for funny, me, it's not you have yet. what I call the Rocky Balboa eye in, in <laughs> just in normal and day to day life. Uh, and that's not, it's, that's not a negative thing. It's just, it's a thing, but they accentuated it in the AI video. I don't know if you noticed that because someone I saw in the comments was like, Chad, this looks like you had a stroke in the yeah, comments. Dude, and also the <laughs> lips, like I'm saying things in for at, at one point, like I was talking and my lips were like barely moving. It looks like my lips were like squished back. Yeah. Right. And I think that once again, it will get better. It's just, it's not there yet. And for I'm going to sure. wait, you know, six to 12 months and I'll, I'll go. Re, you know, I'll go back and visit the I think, but yeah, I know this anyways. is your podcast and it's we're getting on time, but can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, so my question for you is this. Uh you guys are um it seems to me, and maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like you're also 
unintentionally, maybe you're intentionally doing it, but you just didn't realize that you've been making this shift from offer market fit to product market fit, trying to find that product instead. Because I've watched your journey over this last year and you did a lot of the things of like leading with the education, which is fine. And it's, yep. you know, it's great. You had a lot of success in that challenge, a lot of people on it. But as far, it seems like you guys have just from conversation, it's like you're so focused on product right now in a good way. Um, yeah, I think for that, us, like for the last, I would say for at least the last three months and moving into this this quarter, um, our main shifts have, we've literally stopped on features because we have we were just at a point where for two years we were just like feature every day, feature, 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 feature. And it was like, it got became so crazy to the point where when you're launching so many features, you're also launching a lot of bugs along the way, mm-hmm. right? You're introducing a lot of new code into the development platform and it, it can take a toll on the user. So like for us, for the last three months going back and moving into the rest of this quarter, we've been highly focused on going into the platform and just making it 10 times better. Yeah. And by that, I mean more reliable, less bugs, faster, um, looking at things in the UI and making it less confusing to use, right? Just moving some stuff around, small stuff, nothing crazy, right? And then, uh, um, you know, our goal is to finish that by the end of Q1 uh, here in 2024. Uh, and then we'll obviously we'll go back to features and stuff like that. But for us, we're planning on going deeper versus wider. Like we want to go deeper into the features that we've already built. Like we have reputation management. We have a funnel builder. We have a CRM. We, you know, we have all of these things and a hundred other features, but I feel like we're not the best at it yet. We just have a lot of features. And for us, I want to be the best at a couple of things versus having a platform that just has everything, but it's like 50% subpar, right? It's missing a lot of things. So that's kind of going to be our, 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 trend moving forward in the next couple of quarters as well as obviously we're focusing heavily on our white label fulfillment yeah. making that 10 times better because i feel like we are the industry leader in white label fulfillment especially how it's it's done through technology like through our platform automated onboardings like nobody's doing it to the level that we're doing it so we're definitely going to scale that side of the business up in is, are you seeing any immediate effects of it or not yet yeah yeah 100 percent. yeah definitely um, you know, as you start crushing bugs and stuff like that, it's obviously like less tickets, less people complaining, better retention. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we are seeing that, um, we're also going heavy right now into ads. So we, I've just been iterating and creating a bunch of ads. Like I think in the last three days I've created 24 different, you know, video ads. So like we're cranking out a lot of content. Obviously we've got the podcast going. We want to get, you know, you know, when I started dash clicks, in 2018, I was doing a live webinar every single week. And those live webinars had, you know, anywhere between two to 500 people on them. Usually that was kind of the norm live. And then it would get a couple thousand views after because we would post it on our YouTube. We would send it out an email blast and all that good stuff. It's like those those pieces of content created a lot of virality for Dashlakes. And then I stopped doing it for like two mm. years. And I stopped doing it because it's it takes a toll on you. Like you're literally going live every week and you know, it's, it's very tedious. Um, I, but as an outsider it, looking in as a fellow software company, can I tell you just one thing that I think would be awesome? Yeah. And I know you've been working on it for a while, but it would be great. It's not a feature, but it's more of a access would be since you are stopping features for a while and just going deep, if you opened up your API to other developers to be able to build on, it would allow us to, it would allow your software to continually have new things people can do with it. Like AI, my AI chatbot could connect to your messenger. All I need is a get and a post. Well, yep. you know, yeah, it's been on our roadmap for a while. Um, I know the backend team has been working on it on their off time. Like kind of like get some free time. They, they have been working on making it. We do have our whole platform <laughs> API, obviously it's just not public, right? Yeah, that's so, what I, um, I yeah, I know they're they're working on creating a public version of it. I know that that's kind of it's already been worked on. Um, it's just a slow process and it's not something that's on like the top of our <coughs> list right now. Yeah. But we are going to get there and hopefully this year we'll be able to launch that public API. That would be awesome because I know like I could have a whole inflow of people that would love dash clicks. Like the, the UI is very impressive. I think of dash clicks like 
I know that you can't always use UI as a selling point, but I go back to my dad. He taught me something. He said that there, they used to sell these trash pumps at, for his company and there was his company and then there was another company and the other company's trash pumps just looked so much cooler, but the specs were exactly, people always bought the one that looked cooler. Yeah. So I mean, I really we, think, we, we dedicate a lot to UI. Yeah. Um, it's a beautiful platform. Process. I think that uh, the more that it connects with stuff, you're going to just see it go. It's going to really 100%. be awesome. Yeah. Well, hey, Ross, um, I know we're running out of time here. Um, thank you so much uh, for jumping on. For the people that are listening, uh, if they want to reach out to you, see more of you, where can they, where can they reach out to you on? Um, Consolidator, like my YouTube channel. Cool. I, I've been put, just posting a lot of videos there. Um, I have a free school account that called The Nexus. Uh, you can probably search the Nexus and you'll know because it's an AI generated graphic that has letters in it that don't mean anything. <laughs> awesome. Well, reach out, go to Consolidata, uh, reach out to him on Nexus on School. Ross, once again, thank you so much, brother. And I'm sure we'll see you here very soon. Have a good one.